Hello, I'm Andy Coulson and welcome back to Crisis What Crisis, the podcast which aims to guide you towards a more resilient approach to life and whatever it might throw at you. I'm delighted to say that my guest today is the former Chancellor George Osborne. George became an MP in 2001, then the youngest Conservative in the House of Commons. He later ran his good friend David Cameron's leadership campaign in 2005 and became Shadow Chancellor, a role he held for five years until he helped guide the Conservatives back into power in 2010. At a time when people are saying it's only two more Chancellors until Christmas, it's worth pointing out that George held that role in government for what now seems an epic six years. During that period, he faced a number of crises, perhaps most significantly the 2008 financial crash and its long repercussions and, of course, ultimately the Brexit referendum that brought an end to his time in government. And there were, of course, plenty of other less historically significant but still painful bumps in the road too. So George is a guest who can help us understand the current political crisis, adding insight on what life is really like behind the door of Number 10 and the Treasury and also along the way offer his valuable view on crisis management as a former politician, but also, of course, as an ex-newspaper editor and now banker. I should also add this disclaimer before we start. George and I work closely together in opposition and for a while in government. We were and are friends. So apologies in advance for any hints of bias that might creep in. Uh, but it's not the BBC, so I'm sure you'll forgive us. George! Welcome to Crisis What Crisis. Oh, it's great to be on this show, Andy. What on I'm very earth? Very excited. What on earth are we going to talk about? Well, do you know, politics is partly about timing and uh, <laughs> podcasts are partly about timing. So you've picked, we, although we fixed this some months ago, I think. Yes. Uh, this is uh, a good week to do it. <laughs> it certainly is. Um, I was here, we're recording this in Millbank. I was here uh, yesterday as it happens and mm. I bumped into a very senior journalist who we both know, uh, someone who... Uh, is pretty sensible and not prone to uh, hyperbole. He said that reporting on British politics right now is no different to reporting on um, Italian politics. If anything, other than Berlusconi's recent views on Putin, um, it's marginally more chaotic here, uh, he thought. Now, that's mildly amusing, but it's also deeply depressing, isn't it? It's very depressing. And if anything, you know, Italy has had several decades to get used to non-functioning governments and then they just get on with things without a government but in this country we are used to having you know stable governments fairly predictable politics obviously big changes from Labour to Conservative uh, and back periodically but uh, I think the, the the real damage being done out there to the UK is you know that sort of reputation for common sense pragmatic, sensible, rooted in institutions that have been around a long time, governance. And that, you know, unfortunately is, is looking pretty tattered at the moment. So can you help us make sense of this crisis? I think people will be um, angry uh, about what they're seeing on their TV screens, mm. uh, on, their, on their phones. But I, but I think there'll also be a fair amount of confusion about how something like this can happen. How a Prime Minister, who was obviously not equipped for the job, can get elected, bring a country almost to its knees, and then six weeks after walking into Number 10 is on her way without so much as an apology. So let's start by trying to answer that question, if we can. Yeah. How the hell did we end up here? I think there are three things at work. So there's an entirely self-inflicted Liz Truss disaster, which is she gets in... You know, I was actually prepared to, you know, give her time to prove herself as Prime Minister, and I thought she had more capabilities than, you know, subsequently turned out to be the case. But the mini-budget was a complete self-contained political fiasco and economic disaster. Mm -hmm. And I've not seen anything like it in my lifetime in politics, uh, where you have an entirely self-inflicted catastrophe that brings you down mm -hmm. like that. You know, we've had lots of other crises like uh, the ERM crisis, arguably the Iraq war, uh, the winter of discontent when I was a kid. These were all slow burns. There was a lot of political consensus around them. Um, it wasn't just one person or one decision uh, that um, kind of led to them. And this, so this is a pretty unique case of sort of blowing up the chemistry lab and looking around at the wreckage. So I'd say that's the first thing. It takes place against a backdrop of general global economic crisis caused by things like the invasion of Ukraine, the 
aftershock of COVID. And so, you know, in a lot of countries, there's a strain at the moment with cost of living. And then the final thing is a Conservative Party crisis, which I think, you know, we can talk about at greater length. But I would say stems from the Brexit referendum and all the aftershocks of that. The fact that there's been a repeated change of prime minister is partly because the party won't come to terms with what happened in mm. that referendum. So, mm. the, so there's that element as well. Um, but right now, right here, there's no reason why Liz Truss had to go. Um, you know, within weeks, she was the author of that uh, outcome, that fate, mm. um, with Kwasi Kwarteng and that uh, disastrous mini budget. Look, people make um, errors of judgment. They make mm. mistakes. I can speak to that from a position mm. of reasonable authority. Um, but in, in terms of the safety nets, the kind mm. of big brains who people assume are in the room yeah. when something like this mini budget is kind of being discussed, you know, what happened there? I mean, what was it? Mines were elsewhere, a lack of courage. Uh, they were kept out, excluded. I mean, what's how, how does well, it happen? How does how does it that no one was able to put a hand up and say, just a small point here, has anyone talked to the Bank of England? So the first thing is that um, it was quite it advertised in advance what she was intending to do in her leadership contest. You know, she, she went out and said she's going to borrow money to cut taxes and, and help people with their energy bills. Uh, and... At that time, some people were warning, including Rishi Sunak, that that would be a real big mistake. So it, you know, there were it was quite socialised. It wasn't completely kept secret. There was already quite a lot of, um, you know, there were warning signs out there, warning messages out there. The um, speed of it, though, wasn't it? So I think what then happened, and this is often kind of the case. You know, since I think, you know, the purpose is partly of what you're trying to do, Andy, with this podcast is get people to think of their own situations or crises they may mm. come across in their own work or personal life or whatever yes. and think, like, are there parallels? And you might think, I've got nothing, you know, how, how could anything I'm ever dealing with be like, you know, a government collapsing and an economy collapsing? Well, the fundamental problem here was um, the the kind of early warning signs were ignored. So people saying, if you go down this kind of path there's going to be trouble. Credible people saying that. They, that was dismissed. Then when it came to the actual mini budget, uh, I mean, I don't know all the details at all, so I'm, this is partly a guess, but um, I think an informed guess. A tiny number of people were in the room. Uh, and these people had just been elected. Mm. So they had a lot of power. And anyone around, like the civil service or the Bank of England, were like, well, they're a brand new government, a brand new prime minister, we don't want to be the first people, the first message we don't want to give them is no. You know? So it was courage then? Uh, it was It was a tiny group of people, decision makers. They weren't consulting anyone else, so they were slightly believing their own, you know, if you, if you hear the sort of reports of the Liz Trust, Kwasi Kwarteng and team meetings, they were mm. all like, no one before us has got this right. They've all been weak. They've lacked courage to do the right thing for the British economy as they would see mm, it. Mm. And there was no one in the room who said, you know, hold on. Uh, look, David Cameron tried that. It didn't work. Theresa May tried that. Tony Blair tried that. There's a reason why we have the OBR. There's a reason why we have the Bank of England. There was no one in the room saying that. And they'd part, they, 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 they themselves didn't want to consult anyone. They didn't want to listen to anyone. They, of course, fired the permanent secretary at the Treasury. So the the most senior official sort of paid to say, hold on, slow down, think again, uh, have been dismissed. Uh, and I think the other institutions, you know, the rest of the Treasury, the Bank of England, the, the rest of the civil service, you know, I think probably, uh, and I don't want to blame them for this because it's an incredibly hard situation, they were probably like, these people are brand new. We, we can't, you know, we, I don't, They maybe they did say things privately. I think they did around things like consulting the Office for Budget Responsibility, but they were just ignored. And that, mm. in a, you know, I think in any kind of crisis or any kind of big decision, you always have a tension between needing to keep it confidential and, and wanting not to be sort of, um, you know, eroded away from your big, bold idea with yeah. too many people saying, well, yeah. you, it's too risky. But at the same time, you can get yourself into a kind of bubble, a kind of groupthink where no one in the room calls you out because you're too powerful, you're too new, 
and you're too assertive so that people are scared, right? Um, and you'll have seen it in the newspaper industry and you've seen it in politics where you have a really powerful editor who says, just put it on the front page. Yeah. And the deputy editor says, is that a really good idea? And they can, that's when newspapers can become a real cropper. Yeah. Whereas a really good editor, even if they're very strong, will listen to a deputy, for example. It's true of newspapers. It's true of any walk yeah. of business right. as well, though, isn't it? Is, this isn't really what we're talking about. The fundamental truth of leadership is that you've got to have you have the courage to have people in the room who are prepared to speak truth right. to power. Exactly. That's that is that's the that's the absolute essential ingredient, yes. isn't it, of of, yes. of of sensible leadership and decision making. I would say my sort of number one piece of advice from my various careers is in a crisis or indeed when you're making a big decision or indeed the way you set your business up, always have people who are prepared to tell you you know you're making a mistake and that that doesn't come at a cost to their career, you know, or you don't marginalize them as a result, but yeah. that you actually hold those people very close because they're very precious. And most people mm. in most walks of life don't want to be the person who yeah. says no. Now, the truth is, George, you didn't just make sure you had someone in the room saying that. You actually created a framework to ensure that you got that, but we're the OBR. But let's, we'll, mm. we'll, we'll get onto that a bit further down the road. Um, so that's the how. Let's talk about the why. Uh, why is there such an absence of clear thinking, of a sense of national interest, of an understanding that a government's job, as I think David used to say, you mm. used to say, that our job really is just to lead the country in a better state than we found mm. it. Um, why has that been idea, idea sort of been replaced by this, uh, uh, what seems to me at least, you know, a, a, a kind of... There's always been self-interest in politics, of course, but a, a, uh, that's all there is, it seems, I think, outside looking in at the moment. Or maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just turning it to my dad. I don't know. You might be turning it to dad a bit. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, I, I think Liz Truss w was genuinely trying to do something she thought was right for the country. You know, she, she, she thought previous governments had not focused on economic growth. Certain kind of big decisions had been ducked on things like fracking to make sure we had more you know our own gas or planning changes so that we build homes for young people rather than listen to people who don't want homes being built uh or indeed like top rate to tax very unpopular but she would argue kind of good for getting enterprise going so i think she was trying to do what she, i think she she was mo she had kind of good motives they weren't because if you were only out for yourself and you were only in survival mode and you wouldn't kind of take big risks like she took um, so I think that, you know, but I'm probably, you know, I imagine lots of people listening to this <laughs> at this point shouting at the, <laughs> uh, shouting at the speaker. Um, so, uh, yeah, what is, I think, true is that a longer a government get is in office, and I saw this with Labour when I was the shadow chancellor, and I saw it with the Conservatives uh, when I was working in Downing Street when I was the... Uh, you know, a little, in my early 20s and sort of basically doing the photocopying there. I think the longer you're in office, it is true that you, 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 you kind of get insulated from the real world. You know, you've been a minister for years, you've been chauffeur-driven around for years, you've, you know, everyone's been, yes, minister for years. You've sort of lost your connection with reality a bit. Um, you've started to accumulate all kind of baggage as a party where there are, you know, it's all, we can't do this thing because we tried that two years ago or we said we weren't going to do it three years ago or whatever. So you've, you've sort of got yourself increasingly boxed in and the divisions and the hatreds and the and the kind of, uh, you know, that bastard fired me mentality, it, it kind of builds up. You know, you've now got, if you think about it, we're about to have a new government you know, and there, there, you've you had like, you know, Theresa May come in and fire all the people, myself included, who'd worked for David Cameron. Boris Johnson come in and fire all the people who worked for Theresa May. Mm. You know, um, Liz Truss come in and fire all the people who worked for Boris Johnson. Mm. Right. So you, and there's a limit, and it's a limited number of people you're talking about, right? That's right. So they're all fishing in this, they're all swirling around the same pond, and there's a, a lot of animosity and enmity there, and so you don't have it's quite hard then for those people to try and work together 
and focus on what they think collectively is the national interest. Yeah. And I think, you know, you get to a point, therefore, where there's a sort of shelf life of governments, which seems to be, in my lifetime anyway, adult lifetime, kind of beyond the 10th year. Mm -hmm. You can stretch it out. Tory government lasted 18 years when I was a kid. But, you know, you're kind of beyond the kind of cracking point. The, the cracks begin to appear and the country says, OK, now time to give the other people a chance. So this, so where we are now is a sort of sense of inevitability about it. It feels like, I mean, it's very hard to make, you know, absolute assertions in politics because, you know, as we just see who the hell <laughs> yeah. knows what happens No one next. knows anything. But, yeah. you know, if you were looking at it, if you take a big step back, you'd say the Labour Party, having been in a complete mess under Corbyn, now look pretty sensible, you know, together, united, focused on winning. Uh, you know, Keir Starmer, Rachel Reeves, Yvette Cooper, they look like people who could be a government. Mm. And the Tories increasingly don't look like that. Mm. Now, it, it's not... I don't think the Labour Party have sort of sealed the deal by any means, and who knows, the next Prime Minister in a week's time might well be able to turn the situation around. But that's how it kind of feels. If you, t if you, if you kind of step away from the minute-by-minute -minute drama... Mm. And I remember that strong feeling when I was in Downing Street in the 1990s that Tony Blair and New Labour were coming in and we kind of knew it in Downing Street. And I also got that sense as Shadow Chancellor. It was very exciting, but also kind of rather intimidating feeling that things were moving our way. You know, we were working together at the time. And, you know, you just felt it was all... We didn't quite know how and we yeah. didn't want to believe it. And we certainly didn't want to be complacent. But there was opportunity, yeah. It was a kind of feeling of a change in the zeitgeist and, yeah. a, and a move towards us. Um, and I think you're seeing that at the moment in a move towards Labour. So I spoke yesterday for a, uh, with, a, with a Marine colonel for a, for a, for a future episode. Uh, and we discussed the importance of esprit de corps hmm. in crisis. That ability to bring uh, together men and women from different backgrounds, different beliefs... Mm. Uh, uh, to commit to a common cause. Uh, uh, critical, obviously, in a sort of military and a war, you know, a war conflict environment. But is that is that what you're saying? That 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 that, that that's in the current political climate, and it, and, and perhaps the political system mm. doesn't allow for that anymore. Well, it does allow for it. I think you can create a kind of band of brothers and sisters in opposition and in government. I mean, I think David Cameron was really successful, and it wasn't just with Conservatives, it was Liberal or Democrats. In those years of the coalition government, there was a strong sense of camaraderie and friendship, and the fact sure. I'm still... I'm, 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 I'm talking about the, the, as well, a result of the last five I years. I think it's much harder inside the Conservative movement at the moment. But I don't think it's impossible, and I would, you know, I think whoever becomes the Prime Minister in, in a week's time which should make a huge effort. In fact, I'd say this is their number one job, is to try and get the, the band back together a bit, to, mm. to, to try and bring in the different factions of the Conservative Party and make them all feel that they're represented at the table. Not everyone's going to be happy and there's a limited number of jobs and it's, you know, it's like a game of musical chairs running the country where only two, you know, two thirds of the people don't get a seat. Two thirds of your MPs aren't ministers, so you've got to always be managing that situation. Um, but I think that, and not to think they've got some mandate for some dramatic new policy decision, which I think was the kind of trust government's mistake. They didn't have a mandate. They okay, they won the Tory leadership contest, but they they didn't have a mandate for sort of dramatic economic change. What you know, what she should have done, and therefore what that her successor needs to do is start by saying, I am a prime minister with very limited authority, with a very broken party. I might have a majority on paper of 70 or 80 or whatever it is in the House of Commons, but in practice it's zero. And I've got to painstakingly put everything back together again, like a kind of china pot that's broken. You've got to glue the pieces together. And actually in opposition, David Cameron went to great lengths, and I, you know, I was often his wingman on this, persuading William Hague to come back into the Shadow Cabinet, Ian Duncan Smith to help the Shadow team, Ken Clark to come back into the Shadow Cabinet. People who, mm. it was said at the time, would never help the Tories That's again. Exactly right. And it was painful. And, you know, these people have, you know, understandably have a lot of experience and often come with quite a few demands about how they you know, want to be handled. But 
it's absolutely worth it. Um, and if you're in this kind of, I wouldn't say it's always the case. Sometimes, you know, you 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 know, you don't want to bring back people from the past. You know, an organisation quite often, I think, when you want a fresh start. But I think in, for the Conservative Party right now, you've got to try and bring all these different factions that have fallen out with each other back around the table, or else you haven't got a government. You, I mean, you can be in office and essentially powerless until a general election comes along, which I still think was is still two years away. But um, but you won't get anything done. So if you want to be an effective prime minister, you know you've got to try and get that the party and the government functioning again. What do you think happens next? So as we're talking, we don't even have a candidate yet, but it looks yeah. like um, Boris is serious about wanting to come back. It looks like Rishi obviously will be putting his hat in the ring, uh, maybe one or two others. What's your yeah. read as we sit here now? Well, it's really hard because we're talking, you know, just the day after um, Liz Truss has gone. It's not clear anyone will get the 100 MPs they need to enter the contest. But, um, you know, I guess you would... You would assume Rishi Sunak's going to get the 100 MPs. I think it looks pretty likely Boris Johnson's going to get the 100 MPs, although I wouldn't be 100% certain of that. Uh, and Penny Morden might well get the 100 MPs. After all, more than 100 MPs backed her last time. Hmm. Um, so you could have a three-way contest between those three. Um, and then it seems that I'm, I'm, I'm a Tory party member and my email box this morning has got messages about how I'm going to get a vote in this later this, you know, in the next seven days. Uh, so then it goes, it will go to the members unless there's such a pressure amongst the MPs. I could imagine this environment and clearly the, the Graham Brady's sort of hinting at this, um, the, who's the kind of shop steward of the Tory MPs that the MPs basically say whoever emerges number one from our contest... Um, it's a coronation. It's a coronation. And the number two person has to drop out. Now, yeah. really hard to persuade the number two person to drop out if they fancy their chances yeah. with the members. Yeah. And they've only got to... You know, that will happen within 24 hours. So mm. It's not like you've got the excuse that it would be bad for the country to wait. Yeah. Um, I think there'll be a, but you know, the MPs could collectively say, even if you won amongst the members, we're not going to back you. Mm. So the, it is, the MPs could try and organise that. Uh, the, but even saying it, you think, mm, it's quite hard. It's not, remember, there's not quite a hard, but it would be, it would be uh, the uh, 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 evidence that I am completely wrong about the esprit de corps and that it does still exist somewhere there and that people can recognise because that logically is, is yeah. what should happen, right? But, yeah, if you think of, you know, you've worked among MPs and you've reported on MPs and whatever, they're not bad people. They're under a lot of pressure individually, even more so, actually, in the kind of social media age where, you know, they are on, they, there's nowhere to hide. Sure. You've got to immediately declare yourself on issues and you've, sure. you you can be photographed it's in a the... very st- tough in, You can be photographed in the street with your family on a, you know, when it's your day off. So it's a kind of... They are essentially self-employed. There are 300 and whatever number of self-employed Tory MPs. They've got their own constituencies. They were elected individually. But they, but it's one of those classic things, which is they're self-employed. They're all in competition with each other to a degree for jobs, but they'll only survive if they work together. Hmm. So it's a kind of classic, how do you, how do you overcome the self-interest and the individualism and work as a team? Uh, and that is that, you know, the, the effective leaders in politics are the ones who are able to persuade that everyone that it's in their self-interest to work in a team, that it's in their self-interest to take a place lower in the hierarchy than they would otherwise, you know, ideally like. Sure. And work for a common goal. Um, and it's not, you know, I often think one of the reasons why business people often make very bad politicians, even if they've been very successful business people, is because they go in and they go, why don't you just tell everyone, you know, your chancellor's your finance director, your board is your cabinet, just tell everyone what they need to do and get on with it, right? But in a business, if someone disagrees, they can be fired and security escorts them to the door and they're shown the door and they're never allowed back in the building. In politics, you fire someone, they literally go and sit, literally go and sit immediately behind you and try and bring you down and don't leave the building, right? And your board meeting is your board meeting is your your, your AGM 
is not an annual event. It's a daily event. Mm. You know, mm. you, you're you're permanently in session sure. with your shareholders, i.e. your the MPs. And immediately get to work on their phone in building a campaign against you. So. <laughs> so managing all that is just much harder. It doesn't mean that, by the way, politicians are smart and business people. It's just a completely different set of pressures. It's a completely different set of incentives. You know, and if you go from one to the other, this is by the way true of also politicians who go into business often not that successful. You know, it you just got to understand it's a totally different yeah. environment, and and there are different levers you need to pull and different skills you need to have. Um, of which the number one is, you know, true of all of these environments, just kind of take a moment to look around and listen and learn and work out yeah. how this system operates. So I'm not going to ask you what will happen because who knows. Mm -hmm. uh, as we sit here now, but I am going to ask you, what do you think should happen? Well, I personally would like Rishi Sunak to win because uh, I think he's very well equipped to do the job that's required now of reassuring the world um, that Britain is you know, economically credible. Um, and, you know, last time I was, you know, I was last time I was quite torn because I also liked Liz Truss, but it was clear it should be either Sunak or Truss. So this time I'm pretty clear it should be Sunak. But, you know, I'm only an ordinary party member. Let's go back to, um, let's go back to 2008. Uh, uh, we're in opposition, making progress after turning things around from the death in 2007 in Blackpool, uh, but still a long way from the election. A global financial crisis unravelling as we arrived, literally arrived at conference mm. in Birmingham. Uh, clamours for us uh, to ditch conference immediately and all head back to London. Uh, I talked about this with William, actually, when he came on the pod, uh, William Haig, uh, who was also in David's hotel room with mm. you, me and a few others that night. A live crisis of uh, a pretty visceral mm. uh, nature, closure of Lehman Brothers, uh, etc. What do you remember about that night, George, and the approach that you took? Uh, because that was, that was you you know, in the midst of uh, the sharpest of crises? Well, the only thing I'd say, I I've, I've strongly remember it all, is that we weren't directly, we weren't in charge of running the country. Um, so we were, to some extent, observers. Although, I, from what I hear, you know, I think the government at the time, the Labour government, also felt a bit like observers of what was going on. And, yeah. Um, and we were observers, but it was a massive test because what you was, described earlier about that kind right. of expectation around No, so around that was completely right. Team. It was the test for us, well, was really twofold. Um, so the first was, could we conduct ourselves in a crisis as, an alt as people who look like an alternative government? Yeah. Um, and that meant tearing up all the plans for that week of the conference... Um, you know, being hugely consensual with the government. I, in the middle of that conference, I travelled down to London to see the Chancellor, my, my predecessor, Alistair Darling, in, and pledged that, you know, the Conservative Party would offer full support for the government in handling the crisis. David Cameron gave a very consensual speech or bypassed that speech. So, the, so we had to actually handle those days well. Mm. But the biggest problem we had was that all of our plans that we had put in place for how we would present ourselves to the electorate, which was essentially to say, you know, there are things more important than the economy, were, you know, gone up in flames. <laughs> and we had to pivot to a completely different message for the electorate, a much harder message that tough decisions were coming, the economy was vital, the, the uh, you know, economic stability was vital, the cuts would have to be made to public expenditure, very unusual thing to tell the public for an election. Um, so we had to do a full pivot and I knew, you know, I was in the hotel suite in Birmingham with you and David and William and others watching, we were actually watching the US Congress vote down mm. the kind of rescue package called the TARP and that was the moment that the kind of bottom fell out of the world economy because they suddenly realised the American government can't save this situation, uh, or it looked like the American government couldn't. Um, and I remember just thinking, everything we've planned, everything we've lined up is going to have to change. Um, and it's a much harder, 
environment for us. I mean, it's hard. In some senses, you know, of course, it was catastrophic for the government and its reputation, the Labour government, and its reputation for economic competence and its promises around no more boom and bust. So, you know, in sort of classic sense, you might say, well, that's great for an opposition. But I remember thinking this is going to be really, really difficult for us. Mm. Um, and so it proved to be. And look, if we're being honest, you know, you and I worked on the 2010 campaign. I chaired the campaign, the general election campaign. And we were not completely clear about our messaging. You know, we were, we, right. we were trying to run a, we're, we're telling you tough, honest truths about the economy. And at the same time, we were saying, but by the way, we've got this whole other softer agenda, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, our manifesto didn't really tie in with our economic message. And, you know, we were not, we didn't have as clear a message in that 2010 election as we should have done. Yeah. And we knew it, right? Because we spent many, many hours talking about what we could do to try and get them aligned. And yeah. uh, so, um, and remember, all of the, gen I'm, the I'm, genesis of all that was the hotel room in the middle of the 2008 crash. Yes, well, let's move forward to 2010. I remember actually uh, outside this studio walking over the bridge with you in the early hours of the morning after one of those planning sessions. Mm -hmm. And I remember you saying to me, uh, uh, this is this is going to be so difficult to get to a majority. Mm -hmm. The numbers don't really work. This is, a, this is a, a hell of a mountain to climb. And I'm not convinced that we can get to, I'm not convinced that we can get to a majority, mm -hmm. partly because of the numbers. Mm. But partly because of that disconnect that we knew we had in the in the in the campaign, yeah. and you weren't wrong, because that's that that was essentially the that was the, essentially the <laughs> result that we ended up with, um, which leads to a different crisis. Mm. So we're then plunged into that extraordinary period, great drama. Mm. Mm. Uh, can we make this coalition work? Um, what do you remember about those days in terms of the management of it? And the approach that you that you took, because you you talked about the pivot in two thousand and eight, and here we are again having to pivot again yeah. in an entirely different way. So the first thing you know, and since we're talking more broadly also about crises, is you know often in a crisis you are exa physically exhausted. We were physically exhausted. We mm. just fought a general election campaign, and we, you know, historically we'd actually done incredibly well. David Cameron got more new seats for the Conservative Party than almost any Prime Minister before him. Mm. But it wasn't enough because the mountain we'd had to climb was that much, that, that bit taller. Uh, so you, we were then in this hung Parliament situation, first time for 40 or 50 years. No, no rule book about how to, uh, you know, handle that. Um, and, and, you're, and you're shattered. Uh, and I, you know, I take full... I'll take my feel like hat off to David Cameron. He yeah. kept his cool. There were a load of people running around. You get really another thing in a crisis. You get sort of very poor information. You know, everyone feels entitled to sort of come in with some little anecdote or some tidbit of information that doesn't. There's no filter. It all goes straight mm. to the leader. There was no shortage of people in the room, right. either actual or virtual, saying, you know, <laughs> we should point. do this, we should do that, yeah. we should, you know. <laughs> um, so he first of all was calm. And I think there were like two, two or three things he did. First of all, like all good leaders, he had anticipated that this might be a problem or might be a situation and had planned for it. So several weeks earlier, he had spoken to me privately and said, we might well be in a hung parliament situation. I want you to go away and think about whether we could put a coalition together with the Liberal Democrats. And I had very privately had meetings with William Haig and Ed Llewellyn, who was the chief of staff, and um, Oliver Letwin. And the four of us had read the Liberal Democrat manifesto and literally gone through it and said, we can agree to that, we can agree this, we can agree that. And the Liberal Democrats, when we then subsequently presented them with it, were so impressed that we had done the work, that we'd taken their ideas seriously. And we now know that Gordon Brown had never even read the manifesto. Indeed. And, and so on. So first thing, Cameron had prepared in advance for a possible outcome a possible scenario second he told everyone to go and get some sleep on the morning of that election i don't know if you remember i but, do remember right yeah he says go everyone go and get two or three hours sleep we're all exhausted yeah. again lots of other leaders would have thought that was a sign of weakness or you know how the last thing you want to be doing is going to bed mm. but actually it was like we actually physically need to be able to handle being awake for a long period after <laughs> so 
I thought that was smart. Yeah. And then, you know, the big, okay, he takes lots of advice from people, lots of random, um, you know, voices coming in, but he fundamentally makes the big call, which is we're going to offer a coalition to the Liberal Democrat, a full-on coalition, which no one had anticipated. They thought there might be some kind of arrangement with them or we'd govern as a minority or we'd leave Labour in place to fall, about, fall apart several months later. But no one had anticipated that. And it was, a, you know, as he described it at the time, it was a big, generous offer. But it was actually the thing that secured a five years of stable government thereafter. That That's moment. Exactly right. And yeah. any other arrangement, a minority Conservative government, a, um, a kind of what was called a confidence and supply arrangement with Liberal Democrats, i.e. not a full coalition, or putting or leaving Labour in, would have led to further political chaos at a mm. time of real economic chaos. Remember, mm. it's not dissimilar to the situation we have now. Britain was in the markets, under pressure. People were looking at our politics. They thought the hung parliament would mean we couldn't make any difficult decisions. The yields on the government, British government debt were starting to go up. Our neighbours were falling over, like Ireland and Greece. And so, you know, there was a real danger of a repeat of, of what we've seen in recent weeks, which has, by the way, proved that probably what would have happened if we hadn't taken those difficult decisions and we hadn't formed the coalition. Yes. Um, so, you know, I thought David handled that all brilliantly, really brilliantly. And I'm, you know, the, by the way, you know, lots of things I think he didn't handle so brilliantly. So I mean, we were coming on to the Brexit yes. reference. Yeah. So, you know, I've, I don't, it's not that I would say this of all the things he said, but I thought that was him at his absolute finest hour and, and a finest hour for the country as well because it gave the country a stable government in an economic crisis, you know, which is what we sadly lack at the moment. Um but, you know, and I guess there are lots of lessons you can draw from that about how to handle a crisis. Prepare in advance, listen to voices, but ultimately you've got to make the decision, physically get yourself into shape so you're not so shattered that you can't think straight. Yeah. Wasn't there also, though, just to sitting underneath this, because of course there was personal ambition, right? Of course mm. he wanted to get over the line. Of course you wanted to get into the Treasury. Well, you know, we all did, right? That's, mm. the, that's part of the how you create this breed of call. Yeah, we yeah. all wanted it. Um, but underneath it, wasn't there also a kind of belief that this was the right thing to do? So when we're then, those conversations with the Lib mm. Dens, they're manifest in the way that they do, and then suddenly... You know, uh, I'm sat in my little example from the communications end. I'm sat with people that I barely knew, two you know mm. members of the Lib Dem Comms team, and saying, right, you're my deputy. Mm. Off we go. Let's let's get stuck in together. You're having a similar conversation at a you know at a better policy level with mm. Danny Alexander. Uh, Danny Alexander, I think, ends up becoming a, you know a, a, a friend and a, yeah. and a and a proper colleague. That ability to kind of, you know, we've talked about the inability mm. of the Tory party to be able to work together. Here's an example of working with another party yeah. in the national interest. So that national interest bit, I don't yeah. want to be sort of poetic or naive about it, but that is the key, isn't it? Well, I think that's what you've got to find. Yeah, uh, that's true. I think David Cameron had, as all the enduring prime ministers have, um, a strong sense of national interest and doing the right thing um and uh, that wasn't just kind of bullshit for the tv that mm. was something you know you and i spent many hours with him privately and you know that he felt you know he felt he, yeah. he felt that's who he is and um he felt a sort of strong responsibility i think actually the liberal democrats felt the same way um nick Clegg, who i'm still very much in touch with and friends with um so yes that helped a lot um and, um, you know, I guess I'm trying to think. I mean, it. That, I guess having that, the, you know, I think it's partly kind of good fortune that the parties were led by those people at that time. Because um, you could easily imagine a different Liberal Democrat leader saying, well, it might be what the country wants, but it's going to be a fiasco yeah, no, for the I, Liberal I, I, Democrats. I, I, I totally agree. And you I can totally, imagine other yeah. Tory leaders saying, well, I don't yeah. want to share power with any Liberal Democrat. Yeah, yeah. So... It, there was just a bit of luck as well for I would say for UK PLC at that point. Um, yeah. One of the first things you introduced, of course, as Chancellor, uh, was the OBR, the Office for Budget Responsibility. Uh, we walked, we worked on the uh, on the launch of that idea together, and I remember that although it was obviously kind of you know initially eye catching, that horrible yeah. phrase in in politics, it was also undeniably the kind of right thing to do in what was a uh, undeniably tough economic environment. Mm. Um, but we knew, didn't we, that it was going to become, you were very clear, 
this is going to be a complete pain. <laughs> Right, there, we there are were setting, moments, There were we, moments when it was. For we me. are setting yeah. ourselves up to get a regular and repeated smack on the nose. Yes. But you said, and I'm going to remind you of the words that you used when you launched it. And I'm doing this because it's you know it's so uh, topical right now. You said this is not about party interest; it's about the national interest. The advice that we've received from the Treasury and the Bank of England make that clear. That's what you said on May the seventeenth, two thousand and ten. So when we're looking at a situation now where we know full well that the Prime Minister or, or soon to be ex-Prime Minister uh, uh, chose not mm. to take advice from the Treasury and the Bank of England, how do you feel about that? I mean, is, is there a personal frustration in this for you? Well, actually the opposite. I mean, no one's going to get rid of the OBR now, are they? <laughs> I mean, <it's, laughs> I'm sorry it's come at such a painful <laughs> price, but... Um, yeah. It has the last few weeks have been a complete vindication of what of the of what the OBR was all about. For those who you know don't follow the ins and outs of this, until we created the Office for Budget Responsibility, chancellors and governments marked their own homework. They told the country, you know, we think the economy is going to grow, and because the economy is going to grow, tax revenues are going to go up because people are earning more and businesses are making more profits, and that money is going to flow in, and we're going to use that to you know, fund the NHS. And that all becomes basically a lie if the economy, you think, because, you know, the economy doesn't grow as a result of your plans and then there isn't as much money coming in as you thought there would be or told the country there would be. And the OBR are the people who come in and make that judgment now. They they say, well, we don't really believe the economy is going to grow, even if you do, or we've got to be more realistic about the world situation or, you know, this this big change you're making in policy is probably not going to lead to the amazing results you think it's going to lead to. So they are the independent judge now, and that means much more honest public finances and forcing the politicians to confront the decisions uh, about raising taxes or cutting spending to make the sums add up. Truss and Quarting ignored the OBR for the very reason that they thought that the OBR would say that their growth plans wouldn't fund themselves, that there would be a hole in the public finances, they would have to borrow more. So they, they chose to sideline them, and that, I would say, was one of the really big causes of the fiasco. It wasn't just that they announced these tax cuts that couldn't be paid for. It was that they had trashed the UK's economic institutions. They'd fired the Treasury Permanent Secretary on day one, unbelievably arrogant, stupid thing to do. They had uh, sidelined the OBR. They'd gone around trashing the reputation of the Bank of England. Mm. And all those three things came back to haunt them in terms of you know, the market said, well, the thing, the institutions we trust, you're not listening to or you're, or you're trying to sideline or you're firing. And, and, we don't, and we trust them more than we trust you. So the, the long end of a long result of all that is the, you know, I think when people, when I look back at my own career as chancellor, six years, you know, I'm sure that one of the things that will most endure and will be there in decades and decades to come is the Office for Budget Responsibility. And if I wasn't sure about that two months ago, I'm very sure about it now because no one's going to ignore them again. <laughs> so we talk about this podcast a lot, trying to find positives out of crisis. Yeah. There we are. There we are. We've no, and it. it's a shame. It's, it's like been a pretty painful, expensive way to yeah. establish the permanence of the OBR. Yeah. But I think it's a good thing. And again, that's if you come back to kind of leadership and you know, you shouldn't be afraid of creating rods for your own back or having external independent voices um, judge you because it, it you might think it undermines you or you're, you, might under, you think it undermines your power, but it makes you so much more credible and therefore more powerful if you've got, you know, external independent voices confirming what you're saying. Exactly. Um, exactly. So that kind of, you know, I think one of the kind of, certainly in politics, I think it, it's true also in business. Having the confidence to give away power can make you more powerful, if that's not a yes. contradiction. In, so it sounds like a contradiction, but you know, a strong business confidence. leader, strong business yeah. leader will hand to you know the head of a division a lot of responsibility for running that division. So that might be a, you feel a loss of power for the CEO, but it's actually an increase in the power of the CEO because they've got a really well-run division. Mm. Uh, and that means their company's going to be stronger. And that's true in politics too. It's true in the way we run this country. I, you know, I would be in favour of more devolution to the big cities of the north and you know, trusting them to be able to run themselves a bit more, um, which you know, Whitehall doesn't like to do, because they keep saying, oh, well, what happens if it goes wrong? 
you know. Well, sure, but why does it go right? Mm. Let's talk about personal mindset bit here, mm. George, because I think this is could be helpful for people. You know, we've touched on a few of the crises, uh, some that were handled very well. We also, as you alluded to earlier, there were some that were not handled yeah. quite so well. Some self-inflicted, some that came out mm. of a blue sky. It wasn't all. It wasn't all uh, sunlit uplands by any means in the crisis handling uh, uh, during your time in politics. But what always struck me, certainly when I was working with you, and indeed when I wasn't, you seem to have a pretty pragmatic approach to these things. Mm. You are able to sort of separate out the emotion, even though on occasion some of the criticism mm. you had has pretty been pretty personal. Mm. You didn't take it personally. You saw it for what it was. You saw it as the weather, really, and it's just something to be navigated. Have I got that? Have I got that right? Is that well, is that your instinctive <laughs> approach when these problems come? Yeah, I guess I am trying to prag. I'm pragmatic. I'm trying to solve the problem. I'll kind of work with anyone to fix it. Um, I sometimes, when I'm, I, I sometimes have a strange sort of out of body experience, which is I kind of see myself, you know, if I could look back on my political day as the chancellor, and then I'm observing the chancellor and what other people are saying about the chancellor, and I and I try and think about it kind of coolly and rationally, um, rather than get sort of caught up in the emotion. I mean, the the danger of that is you can be too cool and too rational and not emotional enough, I would say. With the, that's a danger of that approach. Yeah. And sometimes in leadership, people want a bit of kind of messianic, bit crazy, bit like, oh my God, this guy's got such belief in himself. It's all, mm. you know, this girl's got such belief in herself. It's all, you know, there is a bit of kind of, you know, you don't want to be, sometimes you can't, you don't want to be too cool and too rational in a, in a political environment and if anything i may have heard on that side of things but but generally yes i was always i thought uh, you know a really important thing is to try and see how other people see you to try and see if uh, what they're saying has any legitimacy or they've got fair points yeah. they're making it's really it, it, these are very hard things to do as human beings because no one really wants to confront the fact that they may be wrong about something, um, and um, and you know, and 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 then try and fix it and have the confidence to try and fix it. You know, in the by like twenty thirteen, so after I've been chancellor for three years, three or four years, it had been a quite, di you know, for me as a public person, it had been difficult, and I'd been, you know, uh, people didn't like me, and I'd been booed at the Paralympics and all this kind of thing and so the easy easy thing and I'd sort of fallen into this trap was to sort of hunker down I was like well sod you I'm just going to stay in the treasury and get on with the numbers and do my job of, and I'm not you know and why, why would I want to go out and talk to anyone about it did that one hurt well yeah it did hurt but but it, it was a mistake you know that was the the response was a mistake and it took me about six months to realize and you know I got some good advice along the way you've got to go out and explain what you're doing right you're the chance exchequer you're making big decisions that affect a lot of people you can't just stay in SW1 you can't just stay in the treasury mm. you've got to get out and go around the country and you've got to talk to people and you've got to do a load of interviews and you've got to be seen you know all around the UK and what you know and it, I promise you like you're sitting comfortably in your office in the treasury and it's like, do I really want to get on a train to Newcastle tomorrow and it's going to, aren't I going to come across someone who's going to say something unpleasant to me and I'm going to do some interview and they're going to you know, be unpleasant to me and wouldn't it be easier just to stay here? And I've got an important meeting in London tomorrow so there's a good reason to stay here. But, you know, the, the but once, you know, it's such a breath of fresh air if you get yourself on that train to Newcastle, to use this example, and you're mm. out there and you're mm. explaining what you're doing. And I made a you know conscious decision to do that, having got it wrong for for at least half a year. And then that was, you know, it kind of ultimately morphed into me being in kind of high-vis jackets all over the place. But that, the origin of it was get out and tell people what you're doing and show people. So that's a crisis truism for you then, is it? Is it the bunker is not the place to be? The you bunker is not the, well, in the absolute kind of moment of a crisis, like the eye of the storm, Choose your people. You have to be in the bunker or whatever. You have to be 
in the room and you have to solve the problem and the, I, you have to come up with a with what we'd say in government as a policy or a you'd have to come up with a plan and you have to clear everything out you have to cancel everything in your diary you have to you know however important it is you just have to basically create the space and the time to make the decision but once mm. you've made the decision you then need to leave the bunker and get out there and yeah. you know and you know i would say one of the mistakes liz truss made um you know after the mini budget it which was clearly a probably unsurvivable disaster but nevertheless it might have been a route out mm -hmm. you know she then hid away she didn't come out and yes. talk about it. She got Jeremy, you know, it was the right decision to appoint Jeremy Hunt to get rid of Quasi Aquatic. You know, that's what prime ministers do to survive, yeah. you know, tough business politics. Yeah, but not, but not why let Jeremy Hunt a, make yeah, all those yeah. announcements? She should have been standing next to him. She should have been going out doing interviews. She yeah. should have got on a train and loads of people would say, Chancey, Prime Minister, you can't get on the train to Newcastle because, you know, you've got to see all these MPs who are very upset today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the truth is that the, at that point, the best way to get the MPs less upset was for them to see her out there confronting the public, confronting the media, doing the interviews. And, you know, in the end, we barely saw her. You know, she did a brief statement. She obviously did at the very late stages of one, you know, kind of interview on the BBC. Yeah. But it was not enough. Yeah. And in a crisis, having so resolved what you're going to do, you don't want to do this. You don't want to go out there and talk about it unless if you haven't resolved what you're going to do because that will maybe add to the crisis. But once you've resolved what your plan is, you've got to go out and sell it and front it up and own it and, and whether it's the workforce of a company or the public in terms of politics or whatever it is, you've got to, you know, my view, lead from the front in that respect. We can't have a conversation about crisis without discussing Brexit. Um, uh, some will argue that the crisis clock, you know, that we've been, or the, or, the, or the kind of era of crisis that we find ourselves in that we've been discussing sort of started there. It's uh, widely understood that you didn't think a referendum was a good idea, right? Uh, do you regret not doing more to try and stop it, George? I don't think I could have. Um, you know, I made clear my opposition. I thought it was a bad idea. Um, but I was also part of a team and, you know, we had the discussion and I was essentially outnumbered. Um, and then I, I don't think if I'd resigned or that would have stopped a referendum happening. Um, the Conservative Party very much wanted a referendum. David Cameron wanted to have a referendum. The other senior members of the cabinet wanted to have a referendum, with the only exception of Michael Gove, ironically. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, you know, actually when it came to it, the Labour Party also voted for the referendum when it came to the kind of big vote in Parliament. So, you know, there were a lot of people who wanted it. Um, I, you know, I, uh, for me, the, 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 the political mistake, obviously, for the Cameron government was to bet the farm on one vote. You know, and then, as a result, lose the farm. Um, and I also thought that, um, you know, I guess I fundamentally thought these decisions are better taken by parliament than in a referendum, you know, if you're going to make these decisions. Because there's more time to examine the, you know, the real, all the arguments and you, you don't get it hijacked by other issues. Although to, I think to be fair, the Brexit referendum wasn't really hijacked by external issues. People did focus on Europe, but they were presented in my view with, you know, solutions that turned out not to be credible to, you know, we've got the same level of immigration today as we did at the time of the referendum, but we were told that the referendum would solve the immigration yes. issue. You know, we were told it would lead to a stronger economy, but like really almost no one outside of Britain thought that, and no yeah. one who was, you know, very few economists would have said it would lead to a stronger econ uh, economy. So, you know, we didn't really have enough time to um, expose those arguments. And I think, you know, I think the biggest mistake we made for those who wanted to stay in the EU was that we didn't really lay the ground. Right. You know, we had spent years, but this is also true of absolutely committed Europhiles on the Labour side. It's not just like me and David. And, you know, we had spent years pointing, you know, picking fights with Brussels or claiming victories over Brussels. And then on a 
pinhead. You know, we said we had to pivot. We must stay. <laughs> like literally with a month to go. Having told you for months and years, like exactly. Brussels is so frustrating and Britain's, you know, being unfairly treated. Or we vetoed this thing because we were going. You know, suddenly we had about a month or six weeks to to make the 50-year argument about why it's been in Britain's interest to be a yeah. member of the EU. And that was way too late. That was, you know, the, the you know the train had long left the station by there. Um, but from, your, from the point of view of your decision-making... By the way, I, on that la latter point, I saw that much more clearly after the result than at yeah. the time. So yeah. I'm not... Oh, much well, easier in the... My, that was much easier behind hindsight. Yeah, but, yeah. but in uh, terms of you and your decision-making, the, the brutal truth, George, is that you opted for loyalty. Right when others chose another path. Well, it's, what is true? So I don't think I could have stopped to the referendum. No, but, but in, term, in, in terms of during your... the referendum, I could have um, kept my head down and said, "I'm the chancellor. I don't think it's right for me to get too involved in this issue because you know I've got to manage the economy, whatever the outcome." Uh, and I think if that had, if I'd done that, I probably would have succeeded David Cameron as prime minister. Because yes. after all, that's what Theresa May did. Yes. And she was a Remainer. And she got all the support of the people who had been backing David Cameron and me. Um, so, but, so how do you feel about that now? Well, do you know, I feel pretty good about it because... And I think it's different. You know, she was the Home Secretary. She was not as central, you know, as I was to the economic argument. And I thought I could see it was all going wrong. I had a very bad feeling about the referendum. This is not with the benefit of hindsight. I had the foresight... I, you know, I told people at the time, I think we're going to lose this, or we could well lose this. And um, I thought that as Chancellor, if I threw everything, and I'm not saying I necessarily did this in the right way or got it all right, and you know, self-evidently, because we lost, but I thought I might be able to move the needle personally, that I could drag the country in a not particularly, it's not a very edifying campaign but a campaign that says you are going to be economically worse off yes if you vote for brexit project fear was what it was called by um our opponents but uh you know i it was grounded in strong reality and i would say britain's economic performance since the brexit referendum has been clearly worse than it would otherwise have been and that is what everyone from the obr we've been talking about to the you know bank of england to the imf to Anyone who looks at the British economy externally would say, and you know, so I think that you know there I I could you know I felt I could have affected the result. I certainly don't believe, as is often written, that Project Fear made Brexit more likely. I mean, tragically, it was the only argument we had that really worked in that campaign. Mm. You know, there were people. The result I think would have been bigger for Brexit if people hadn't had a bit of nervousness about the economic consequences. So all the other arguments for the EU, about international cooperation, about you know uniting the West against our enemies, uh, about solving problems on the European continent in a collaborative way, about working together on climate change, all these other arguments about the EU that had no traction at all because we hadn't really prepared the ground. The only argument we had was you will be worse off if we leave. And we doubled down on that. And that, that came, you know, for me at a very high price politically because it burnt my bridges with a lot of Conservative colleagues who were, you know, I could completely understand, very upset about the way I, um, you know, did it. Um, but I was fighting for what I really believed um, and I really thought it would be a bad thing for the country. And by that point, I was like, I know this is doing enormous damage to my career. And even if we win this referendum... I have burnt a lot of capital with my conservative friends. Um, but, you know, I did think it was the right thing and I did believe in what I was saying. So, you know, um, and it wasn't, it was clearly not self-interest because the self-interested thing to do would have been to hide beneath the bed the, covers. It was the very opposite. The nature of your exit itself was pretty brutal, right? The black bin, by, uh, bin line, a treatment from Theresa May. Mm. Uh, pretty disrespectful uh, given the role you played for the party and for the country, I would say, uh, mm. as your friend. Um, it must have hurt. I, yeah, it did hurt, but not... Um, so I come back to what I was saying about the... Uh, the sometimes I have this sort of outer body mm. 
kind of um, approach to politics. And I remember sitting in the room with Theresa May as she fired me, thinking, you are handling this so badly. If I was firing myself, I would be doing it in a completely different way. I, I could, How would you have fired yourself, George? Well, uh, first of all... So it was, you know, I could see what she, she, her thinking, you know, I'm sure was, I've got to try and construct a government that has got Brexiteers in it as well as Remainers. I'm a Remainer. If my Chancellor's a Remainer, it's going to look like we haven't brought the Brexiteers in and George Osborne has to go to make that all work. That is a perfectly rational political decision, even if not, not one I thought, you know, yeah. I supported. Yeah. Because I... But if that's the decision you come to, then there are two things you should do. This is, by the way, true of getting rid of anyone, mm. right? Particularly in an environment where they're going to go and sit behind you, right? And not leave a building. The first is you should tell them in advance that, you know what, George, it's very unlikely you're gonna, there's going to be a place for me in, in my government. But then it was, you know, we knew for quite a few days that Theresa May was going to win. And so then I would have resigned, like David Cameron had done, walked, you know, had a kind of leaving party at the Treasury, mm. walked out of number 11 Downing Street, mm. head held high, resigning. And it was a bit of a fiction because I, I might have wanted to hang around to see if I'd got a job, but I'd been told clearly I hadn't got a job. And so that would have been a kind of graceful departure. Mm -hmm. First thing, she didn't do that. Second, you know, she, she then... So she deals with me very, very curtly in the meeting, and then I'm told to leave by the back door and clear out of the. What park. did she say to you? Well, she said, you know, if I can, she said, um, speaking to you as a sort of older sister, I think you need to get to know the Tory party better, right? To which I was like, again, I had this sort of out of body. I was like, yes, Prime Minister, thinking like, is she really handling this situation like this anyway? Um, and then when I left, I was told by her out of office to leave by the back door and get out of the apartment where my kids were living, right? And at that point, I said, I am going to do everything to bring you down. Not to say it to her personally, I said to myself. I thought that is so ill-mannered, ungraceful, no respect for my family at that point. And... What are the ironies here, George? Is and I, you know, I, and I, I, by the way, I did have a kind of meeting with her later. And we did sort of... Because I said then some not pleasant things about her. And we did subsequently meet and got to take the heat out of it all. But um, if you're getting rid of someone, you know, even if you've got very good reason for it, you know, you should do it with dignity and grace. Let them have some dignity and grace in departure. Yes. Um, that's true. And I would say in a business, you never know when these people are going to yes. reappear. Um, but also, in, particularly in politics. Yes. Uh, because these people don't immediately go. Yes. Um, one of the ironies here is that I will, will remember sitting, standing outside the cabinet room when we'd just gone into government and uh, Theresa came out having just been given the big job uh, Home Secretary with a look of astonishment on her face that it had happened and, of course, and I know full well that you were one of the people that was encouraging that idea. If it, indeed it possibly even suggested it. It was, I'm not, I, it was certainly, I was strongly in favour of making a Home Secretary, yeah. And, and by the way, I had like a big respect for her as a political figure and cabinet minister and colleague of mine. Mm. Um, but, um, and then, you know, her mistake as Prime Minister was not to work out who her friends were and who her enemies were. You know, her friends, I had voted for her, her friends were the Cameron establishment mm. who had got her into office. But she turned against them and, you know, she ended up with Oliver Letwin being her biggest enemy, which... Quite you, a hard if, thing to do. If you know Oliver, he's one of the nicest, most sort of sensible people. <laughs> Quite a trick. You know, that yeah. was quite a political trick to pull off that Oliver Letwin is your big challenge. And then, of course, it turned out that her newfound friends, the ERG and Boris Johnson or whatever, were not her friends at all. So she kind of got rid of... She lost all the support from the people who should have been her closest allies. Yeah. Um, that, you know, I mean, you know, politics, is, it is, you've got to constantly be thinking, where is, you know, what's my kind of coalition of support here? How can I maximise it, not how can I minimise it? Mm. Um, and, you know, again, you saw with Liz Truss, you know, telling Grant Shapps, you know, you've, you're the best minister in this cabinet, but there's no place at the inn. 
and then five weeks later on your last day in office, well, please, can you be my home secretary? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it doesn't it's, really work. It doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of constantly surprised that people make these the mistake, you know, again and again and again. I hope that whoever the new prime minister is, you know, they um, kind of learn either from their predecessors or, in the case of one of them, from their previous time as prime minister. <laughs> so, George, um, we're, we're, we're short of time. I've taken up far too much of yours with this conversation. So I did want to talk about newspapers, but perhaps that's time for another... There's time for that on another on, a, on another mm. occasion. Uh, a slower moving crisis, the uh, uh, the world of print media. Um, uh, I'm going to ask you the obvious question. You know, it's the age of crisis as we've, mm. as we've been discussing. It might also turn out to be the age of comebacks. It must cross your mind. I mean, the route to it is not easy, but not impossible in this mad world in which we find ourselves now. You're a relatively mm. young man. You'd be going back in with bundles of energy mm -hmm. and ideas. There's some people have got a flavour of it in this podcast, hopefully. Really? Well, not in your, not in, not in the range of possibilities. So the, the truth is that you know, of course, there's a lot of politics that I miss, a lot of things about politics that I miss. But it also comes at a very heavy price, um, personal price, and it's a bit, you know, it's it's completely all absorbing, and that's what gives it a lot of satisfaction if you're, do, you're in the middle of it all. But it's also, it's only when you stop, you also think, God, that is actually a bit mad that I, my whole life was consumed by this, by this, you know, um, endeavour. Um, and, you know, I, having left politics, there are lots of things I do, you know, new avenues in terms of my career, my work, um, my family, you know, I've got young children again. Um, that all have made for a really, really nice life. Um, and I think, you know, there's, to be a real player in British politics, you have to be a member of parliament. Mm. You, you can't be brought in as a sort of external, you know, like Mandelson was brought in to help Gordon Brown in the House of Lords. Yeah. You know, the truth is the real game is in the House of Commons, as it should be, right? Mm. And I was right in the middle of that game. And I, I just can't at the moment see myself becoming an MP again and giving up everything else I've got. Um, and I do think it's a sort of thing in life, uh, but I'm, you know, who knows? I'm only living one life and, you know, and I've made lots of mistakes along the way. I look back on my time in politics uh, uh, with, you know, real affection that I had, I enjoyed it. I worked with great people, including you and. Uh, it, there was a, the, the team spirit you were talking about. Um, and I think if I, going back, I'm not sure that would all exist again. I had a really golden time, mm. you know, personally, and was very lucky to get to you know, the near top and to work with a prime minister who had huge respect for me and I had huge respect for him. And as a result, we were both stronger for it. So I, I, it's a bit like, you know, if you've been a kind of football star, or, you know, you've been a movie starlet when you're in your 20s. Not that I'm comparing myself to... <laughs> I was going to say, George. No, 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 I'm comparing Steady myself on. to any... But, you know, <laughs> if you've had a kind of success young, yeah. you do have to kind of know how to move on from it and not think you can get back on the football pitch or get or back in the, you know, entertainment business. The, you know, and I think in my... In the very many people I met in my life, both in politics but also actually in things like entertainment... The ones who can't get over no longer being the center of attention have very unhappy lives. Whereas the ones who say, that was a wonderful, incredible experience, I'm so pleased I had it, but I have moved on to other and equally interesting things that aren't quite in the center of attention in the same way, you know, they are much happier. And I am much happier as a result, uh, personally. George, thanks for coming in. Thanks for joining us. That was a great conversation, and I hope also a useful one for people listening. I'm, I'm reasonably confident that that's the case. Uh, really appreciate your time. I'm going to ask you the last question that we always ask. I'm going to ask you for your three crisis cures. These are three things that you sort of lean on in the tough times. Can't yeah. be another person, and I'm also going to say to you, can't be Chelsea Football Club either. So uh, what, um, what, are you, what are your three crisis cures, please? Well, I'm not sure this is exactly how you want the question answered, but anyway. So the first, the, the real cure is you've got to is create time 
So you've got to f find the time to solve the problem and ditch everything else. Um, I'm not going to name one person I would lean on because I don't have one person, but bring in as many people as you can to the... To, I'm a great believer in phoning people up or seeing people and saying, I've got this problem, what do you think, right? Um, rather than keeping it all to myself. And then trying to get, you know, that kind of, like, I guess the last thing would be a kind of glass of red wine at the end of the evening just to kind of, like, you can't go to bed so wound up that you don't sleep and whatever. You need to just sort of take the pressure off yourself a bit right at the end of the day. Get, get some sleep and get up the next day and implement what you've decided. George, brilliant. Thanks so much for coming in. Really Thanks. appreciate this it. This is what a great podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do give us a rating and a review. It really helps. And if you hit subscribe wherever you download your podcast from, you'll find loads more useful crisis conversations. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Our handle is at Crisis What Crisis Podcast. And you can find full transcripts of this and every episode on our website, crisiswhatcrisis.com. Thanks again for listening.